Installation of Linux. Well, it's time to walk you through the installation of the Linux operating system. What you need to know first is that the install program runs within Linux itself. Now that might seem like kind of a contradiction, right? How am I supposed to install Linux if I need to be running Linux already? Well, wh what you need to be running is a very minimal version of Linux. So you need to boot up some minimal version of Linux, then you can do the installation. Now the choices for media are CDs, uh, you can use floppy disks, you can use DVDs, or you can just download it over the network. To download it over the network, you're going to at least have to download uh, like a floppy boot image so, so that you can boot off the floppy. And then uh, when you do the installation, you can point uh, the installation uh, program to the network uh, site where you're going to download uh, Linux from. Okay, and then once you uh, have the have the system booted up and you start the installation program, you have, there's different methods for the installation. You can do a text-based installation. You can do a GUI-based installation where you can point and click at various things and see uh, pictures and graphs of, of the disk partition layout, that kind of stuff. Or you can do a scripted installation, and and this is. Um, this is not on every distribution. Some distributions have this scripted installation, and the scripted installation is good if you're going to install Linux on multiple com computers at one time. So if you're going to do it on like 10 systems at once, then you can do a scripted installation and install it basically the same on all those different systems. Now the installation steps that you have to follow, first you put in the bootable media. So you put in your, your CD or your floppy disk to boot it off of, and then you power on your computer. If it's a network installation, you have to point the installation program to the site. Now, something I want to note with this with this uh, network installation is, you know, when I say a network installation, it could be, uh, you know, you're you're getting it off some site via like FTP or or HTTP or something like that. You're using the web to do this, or you could be working over like some local area network. Maybe the computer that you're installing it on doesn't have a CD drive, and, and, but some other computer in your office does have a CD drive. So you could put the CD in that other computer, do a network installation, and just point this computer to that, that computer and use the CD off that computer. The network installations are definitely the trickiest sort of installations. They, uh, you know, if the network goes down, you've got to start all over, and it's just a little bit trickier. You've got to enter more information. So the network installation is probably not for the, the, the novice user. Okay, if you've already used Linux before, then a network install can work perfectly fine. So if you're not doing a network install, you, you get to choose between a text-based uh, installation program or a GUI-based installation program. Let me just go back to that, that previous slide here. So if, if you think you, know, you don't want to spend money to buy a, a CD or something like that, um, I showed you before where you can download CD images and burn them. If you don't have a fast network connection or a CD burner, that's not going to work for you. But on that same site where I showed you uh, where you could download download uh, CD images like linuxiso.org it was called. Um, you can also buy uh, distributions like CD distributions, very bare bones distributions with no manuals for like two bucks. Okay, or three bucks, or something like that. So, so this is not this is a good option, even if you don't want to spend a lot of money. Three dollars is not that much of an investment for an operating system, you have to admit. So, if you if you think you just want to do it for free and do it over the network, and you're a novice, that might not be the way to go. And it might be better to get one of those, you know, three dollar bare bones distributions to start with. Okay, so so that's our installation procedure. We're basically we're gonna put in a bootable media. I'm gonna boot it off CD, and we're gonna boot Red Hat Linux. I'll power on the computer, and then I'll walk you through the process. I'll, I'll actually do a text-based installation just because I think that's uh, more standard. Um, your, your video card might not support a GUI-based installation, so I'll just walk you through the text-based installation. The GUI-based installation is basically the same. You're just going to be able to point and click instead of using the up arrow and down arrow to do selections, that kind of stuff. So let's get started. So once I put the CD into my computer and I power it on, this is the very first screen that I see. If I want to install Linux, Red Hat Linux in graphical mode, I can just hit enter here. If I want to install it in text mode, I'll type text and it'll show up down here at the boot prompt. And again, I hit enter to do a text mode installation. We're going to do a text mode installation uh, just because every version of Linux comes with a text mode installation. Uh, text mode will work no matter what kind of video you card you have. Okay, uh, And you can follow right along. If you want to do a graphical mode installation and follow right along, you can because the information that we enter is going to be exactly the same. The only difference 
difference is the interface. Uh, in text mode installation, I'm going to use the up arrow and down arrow to select cer certain items. And in graphical mode, you can just point and click, that kind of thing. Okay, and, and you can see in Red Hat, uh, they've got all sorts of different modes. They have expert mode, uh, they have Linux rescue mode, and what this means is if you've already installed Linux before, and now for some reason Linux doesn't boot anymore because your hard disk has some error on it or something like that, then you can boot into Linux rescue mode and maybe fix your hard disk, hopefully, and retain all that information you had before. So what I'm going to do here is just walk you through a whole series of screenshots of the installation process. Instead of showing you live video, and, and the reason I don't want to show you live video is just because uh, during the installation process, you know, the resolutions changes and, and things flicker and stuff, and it just doesn't look good on the live video. So I'm just going to walk you through screenshots of every step along the way of the, of the installation, and I'm not going to skip any steps at all. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to type text down at the boot prompt. And then once I type text, I'm going to hit enter, and we're going to start the process of the installation. So the installation starting, the system's booting up. You can see I'm loading drivers now. And then the first thing that we have to actually answer, a question that we have to answer, is what language would you like to use during the installation process? Okay, so this is the classic sort of, or the standard kind of screen that we're going to see in the text mode installation process. Okay, and you can see down here there's a legend. F1 for help at any time. Uh, tab to move between elements. So if I hit tab now, OK would highlight. If I hit tab again, back would highlight. If I hit tab again, OK would highlight again. All right, and then once I have the proper things highlighted, I hit the space bar to actually select that. And to select between languages here, I can just use the up arrow and the down arrow to move between the various languages. All right, so I'm just going to uh, hit tab to highlight OK and then hit spacebar to move on. Now the next question we have to answer is what model keyboard is attached to our computer? And there I'm just going to pick US. Again, I'm going to hit tab to highlight OK and hit spacebar to select it. And now I have to choose what model mouse is attached to my computer. Okay, I'm going to choose just generic three button mouse. Uh, and that works fine for any three button mouse. And like I said before, you know, it's good to have a three button mouse with Linux just because Linux makes use of all three mouse buttons. Uh, if you only have a two button mouse, you can choose uh, one of the various generic two button mouses here uh, for whatever kind of connection you have to your computer, whether it's a PS2 connection, those little round plugs, or USB, the flat kind of plugs, or the serial connection, which is pretty old and you probably don't have that one. If you want to choose your actual uh, brand of mouse, you can scroll down and choose Logitech or whatever kind of mouse you have. If you do have a two-button mouse, you know, choose whatever one you want, but make sure you highlight or select the uh, emulate three buttons here. Highlight that and then hit spacebar to select it, and then tab down to OK and hit spacebar again to move on. And now it says, welcome to Red Hat Linux. We're about to start the actual installation process. We've booted up the basic version of Linux. We've answered the pre-installation questions. And now we can actually do the real installation of Red Hat. Again, I'm going to tab to uh, highlight OK, and it looks like that. And then I'll just uh, hit spacebar to select. The next question that's asked of us is, what type of system would you like to install? So we can do a workstation installation for some kind of a desktop computer. We can do a server installation, obviously, for a server. We can do a laptop installation, obviously, for a laptop. And installing Linux on a laptop is a little tricky, and there's some special nuances there that you have to worry about. And the laptop installation is going to guide you through those. And then there's a custom installation and an upgrade existing system installation. We're going to do the custom installation, and we could do a server installation or workstation installation, but those installations make a lot of assumptions about what kind of software you want on your system. And I'd rather just guide you through the whole process and, and tell you, you know, talk about all those choices with you so you can get exactly the kind of software that you want on your, on your particular computer. So I'm just going to select OK here and move on. And then the next process is partitioning our disk. So Red Hat gives us the option of doing an auto partition. And what this is going to do is it's going to do a basic partitioning scheme, kind of like what I showed you in the last video with just a few partitions. If you want to partition the disk yourself, you can use Disk Druid or FDisk to do that. Uh, FDisk is kind of like the Windows program FDisk, so if you've used that before, this is pretty similar. Otherwise, if you're not familiar with FDisk, you should just use Disk Druid because it's a little bit nicer and it'll guide you through that process a little more easily. So I'm just going to choose auto partition here, so I'm going to hit the space bar and move on. And now it comes up with this warning. It says the partition table on device SDA was unreadable. Well, the reason it's unreadable is because this is a brand new disk and I'm installing Linux from scratch on this computer. Okay, so the partition table on device SDA was unreadable because it's not there. So it says to create new partitions, it must be initialized, causing the loss of all data on this drive. All right, so would you like to initialize this drive? We'll say yes and move on. 
and now it says it asks a question about how much of the disk is, is really being uh, initialized. So, so say you have a dual boot system, say you have Windows and you want to also dual boot Linux. Well, what you can do there is before you ever get to this installation process, you should partition your disk up to give Linux a big chunk of your disk. And in that case, you could say remove all Linux partitions on this system. If it's just a clean disk and you're, and you're just installing it from scratch, just say remove all partitions on this system. And then it says down here, which drives do you want to use for this installation? If we had multiple drives, they would all be listed here. Uh, we only have one drive on my computer, so I'm just going to say that. Click OK and move on. And now I come up with this other thing. Warning, warning, warning. You, you have selected to remove all Linux partitions and all data on them on the following drives. Are you sure you want to do this? It defaults to no. Just tab over to yes and hit spacebar to select that. And now you can see the partitioning scheme that, it, that it's chosen for us. Okay, so here's the slash dev slash SDA device. So first, before we d discuss this, let's just talk about the slash dev directory for a couple seconds. So the SDA device, the SCSI disk, is going to house uh, all the various directories of Linux, the slash home directory and the slash boot directory and all that stuff. But SDA itself is an entry in a directory on the SDA disk, okay? The slash dev directory just holds one entry for every single device, every partition, all the various devices on the system have an entry in the slash dev directory. And this is just like a, a placeholder. It just kind of keeps track of some information about the various devices. And SDA holds information about itself, okay? So that might seem kind of confusing at first, but don't, don't worry too much about it. Then you can see here all the various partitions on the SDA disk are listed here. So SDA, remember, is the first SCSI disk. SDA1 is the first partition on the first SCSI disk. SDA2 is the second partition on that disk. SDA3 is the third partition, and so on. Then over here, you can see what is actually on each partition. So you can see here the slash boot directory is what's contained in partition 1. And you can also see it's 47 megabytes large. And then the slash partition is on partition 2, or the slash directory is on, par on partition 2. And the slash directory just refers to every directory in the computer except for slash boot, because that's been explicitly put into partition 1. And then you can see here the third partition is the swap partition, and that's 509 megabytes large. And we talked about what the swap partition was in the last video. You can also see that, that everything else in the system, the slash directory here, is taking 3,500 megabytes, which is like about 3.5 gigabytes. Okay, so th uh, there is our partitioning scheme. If it's okay, you can just select okay and move on. If you want to edit something there, you can do that. If you want to go back and just do the partitioning yourself, if you decided after you see this you don't like it and you want to do it yourself, you can hit back and go back and do it yourself. All right, so there's, how, there's the partitioning scheme that we're going to use. I'm just going to click okay and move on. The next question it asks us is which bootloader would you like to use? The default bootloader for Red Hat is the GRUB bootloader, which just stands for the Grand Unified Bootloader. <laughs> That's a good acronym. Uh, and, and this is the default for Red Hat. That works perfectly well. You could also use Lilo as your bootloader. We're going to talk about Lilo in a later video, uh, and, and, but for right now I'm just going to use GRUB and move on here. Then it says, where do you want to install the bootloader? Uh, one choice is the master boot record. If you're just uh, booting Linux on your system, if that's the only operating system on your computer, then the master boot record's the place to put it. Uh, if you're going to dual boot various operating systems, then you can put it in the first sector of the boot partition. And when you turn on your computer, you'll have a choice of what operating system you boot. And then when, if you choose Linux, then it's going to go to the first sector of the boot partition and boot from there. The next option is a very advanced option. It's the bootloader configuration option. Here what you can do is if you need to pass special options to the kernel, you can write them here and, and you know then uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be executed when the system boots up. Like I said, this is a very advanced option. I'm just going to leave all this stuff blank and hit OK and move on. And now we've got our bootloader configuration screen. Basically, if you have multiple operating systems, you can list them out here. So then when your system starts up, you can choose between any of these operating systems to boot. Uh, we just have Linux on this computer, so I'm just going to hit OK again and move on. And now another option is to use a password for the bootloader. So here, if you want to use a grub password, and the only time you do this is in some sort of high security situation. Because if you don't have a grub password, what can happen is, uh, you know, somebody could, a very knowledgeable person could reboot your system, try and like pass some certain options to the kernel to then gain access to your computer as like a root user. Okay, so if you want to prevent that, select this by hitting the space bar to use a grub password. Type in the bootloader password and then type it in again to confirm it. 
and then the next screen is network configuration. We're going to talk all about configuring a network in some later video. If you know what you're doing here, you can you can fill this in. Uh, basically, there's two choices. There's either a dynamic uh, configuration or a static configuration. Uh, a dynamic configuration is the case when your ISP doesn't give you the a static IP address. You get a different IP address every time you log on to the network. Okay, uh, if that's the case, then you star this. If that's not the case, then uh, if you actually do have a static IP address, you can write the static IP address here, write your subnet mask here, write your default gateway here, and your name servers here. All right, but like I said, we're going to talk all about network configuration uh, five videos down the road or so. And the next uh, option is a firewall configuration. All right, so, so just think of this firewall visually. Like, what's a firewall? It's a wall that's on fire, right? <laughs> okay, so if you had a firewall around your house, it would be very hard for people to get into your house. And the same is true of your computer. If you have a firewall on your computer, you can set up various levels here, either no firewall, medium, or high. And, and in that case, uh, you know, it just restricts the access to your computer over the network. If you're running a server or something and you have a high, a high degree of firewall, then, then what's going to happen is it's going to be hard for people to gain access to your servers. And, and maybe that's what you want. Maybe you only want a select group of people to be able to gain access to your server. And in that case, you can configure it uh, just so those people have access to your server. So this, this is, again, for high security systems, uh, you should choose high. For regular systems, just choose medium, and that'll work perfectly fine for most instances. The next screen here says language support, so if you speak uh, some other language, you can choose that here. I just speak English, so I'm just going to leave that alone, but if you speak uh, Estonian or something, you can choose that. Uh, again, you're just going to have the option of seeing various uh, options in Linux in different languages then if you pick that. Next, it says what time zone are you located in. You can choose to set your hardware clock to Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, that would kind of drive me nuts, I think. I'd always have to be converting, trying to remember how far off from Greenwich Mean Time I am. Uh, instead, I'm just going to scroll down the list here, and I get to uh, America, Vancouver. So America is North and South America. When you see a city that you think is in your time zone in Vancouver, British Columbia is in my time zone here in Seattle, so I'm just going to pick that one. Now the next screen is asking us to pick a root password. Uh, the root password is essential for system security. Since the root uh, account has all the privileges on the system, you don't want somebody to be able to get into that account. So pick a root password that's going to be really, really hard to guess. Upper and lowercase letters should be in the root password. Some symbols, like an exclamation mark, should be in there. Or numbers you know, should be in there. Okay, and, and, and it should just be really, really hard to guess for a normal person and also for password guessing programs that are out there. There's password guessing programs that go through every word in the dictionary and, and mix the letters around. They put capital letters in there and stuff. So it should just be really hard to guess. It should have some numbers and symbols in there, like I said. Um, what some people do is they take two words. They take the beginning of one word and the end of the other word. And then they turn letters like L's into the number one or an exclamation mark or something. They turn A's into the at sign that we always use in emails. Okay, so, so just to, to mix it up, to make it hard for some automatic program to guess it. So I'm going to fill in these fields. I'm going to type in my password and I'm going to type it in again to confirm it. And you can see here that it's just all stars. So somebody looking over my shoulder wouldn't be able to tell what I just typed in. And I'm going to select OK to move forward. And now it's asking us to add a normal user account. You can log in as the root user, but you should always add have a normal user account that you do most of your normal day-to-day -day stuff on. You send email and, and browse the web as your normal user account. Even if this is your own personal system, you should have a normal user account to do that day-to-day -day stuff. So I'm going to fill these fields in, and you can see here I've given myself a user ID of Perry, I've given myself a password, and I typed it in again to confirm it, and then I just type my full name. Okay, so there's the information that it needs to create a user account. I'm going to select OK to move forward. And now this is the user account setup page. It tells me what accounts I've added already. If I want to add more accounts, I can select add here. But I'll show you how to add more accounts later when we talk about user administration in Linux. You'll be able to add all the accounts that you want to. For right now, I'm just going to select OK to move forward. And now this page is all about authentication configuration. Uh, the first two things here have been selected by Red Hat already. Uh, use shadow passwords and enable MD5 passwords. We'll talk about this more when we talk about user administration, but for right now let me just tell you that shadow passwords, what that means is that the passwords are going to be stored in a separate file all by themselves. And enable MD5 password says that those, fi those passwords that are stored in the shadow file are encrypted by the MD5 hash function. And the MD5 hash function is just a, a way to encrypt passwords that's proven to be really, really solid. 
wallet. Even if uh, I showed you the encrypted password, you wouldn't be able to decrypt it. Even if you had the most powerful computers in the world on your side, it would take you years and years and years to decrypt that password. And hopefully by that time somebody's changed the password. So, so your decryption won't do any good anyway. Okay, so, so that just adds an extra level of security to regular systems. Now this stuff down here adds extra levels of security to uh, network systems. So if you're in some office or some organization where you have lots of Linux computers all networked together, that's where these things come into play. NIS is the name information server. Basically, uh, this allows someone to sit at any computer in the organization, uh, sit down, type their username and their password, and, and it's just going to look like uh, they're at their normal computer. Everything's going to kind of be the same. They're going to be using the same username, the same password. They're going to have the same files available to them, that kind of stuff. Uh, LDAP is the lightweight directory access protocol. So this is if you want to have some directory information in your organization, like you want to have people's usernames, what projects they're working on, their phone number, that kind of stuff. And this is going to serve that up in a secure way. And then there's Kerberos. Again, in a networked environment, if you need to log on to some other system in the network, and you need to type a password to log on to that system, uh, your password's going to travel over the network unencrypted. And there's things out there called packet sniffers that can read the stuff traveling by on the network, and if they saw your password, they'd be able to log into your account and, and, and delete your files and things like that. But if you have Kerberos installed on your system, that, that's not going to happen, because the password's going to travel over the network in, in an encrypted fashion. So people could see it, but it's going to be the same thing as above here. It's, a, it's an encrypted uh, password, and for them to decrypt that it's going to take them years and years of work. Okay, so, so there's the authentication configuration stuff. I don't have a networked environment for my computer, so I'm just going to pick these two upper ones. Next page, we get to pick the packages to install on our system, all the various software for the tools that we want. And you can see here the total install size is 827 megabytes for all the various packages that they've picked by default. And you can see which ones they picked by default. They're represented by the stars in this column. Okay, so they pick basically very standard stuff, printing support, X window support. Uh, here they pick the GNOME desktop environment. They didn't pick KDE. Red Hat uses GNOME by default. Other versions of Linux use KDE. You can pick them both and then just decide which one you like better. Uh, there's sound and multimedia support, network support. On the next page here, there's dial-up support, messaging and web tools. If you do graphics design, you might want graphics and image manipulation software. Install that package. Then there's a bunch of servers here. A news server, NFS file server. This just stands for the networked file system that we'll talk about later. A Windows file server. You can use a Linux box as a Windows file server. A anonymous FTP server, a SQL database server. These are all choices for you as well. On the next page here, you can see web servers, router and firewall software, all sorts of stuff. There's the Emacs editor that I really like, so I'm going to uh, pick that package. And you can see I pick it, now a star shows up in that column, and also my install size jumps from 827 up to 862 megabytes. Okay, so let's see what's on the last page here of the package group selection. And on this page, you see some other stuff. There's software development tools. So if you want to write code in C or C++ or something, you should install that package. And then the very last thing here is just everything. <laughs> um, this, this might be a little overkill. I mean, you're probably not going to need every single package on this system. You're, are you really going to do Linux kernel development, that kind of stuff? Uh, and this is not your only chance to install software. So don't feel like you need to install everything right now. Uh, you can always install software later, and I'll show you in a later video how to do that. All right, so I'm going to select OK here and move forward. And now it's time to configure my video card. You can see here under video card it says unknown card, video RAM is 1024. So 1024 kilobytes, which is like one megabyte is what this is referring to. So Linux is not very good at probing hardware and determining what hardware you have plugged into your system. It's not as good as the Macintosh or Windows operating system at that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just select change over here and just go in and down a list and pick my video card out manually. So here I've paged down with the down arrow key and I got to my video card which was the NVIDIA GE Force 3 video card. So I'm going to select OK and go back to that previous screen. So that took me back to this previous screen and now you can see the video card is filled in. NVIDIA GE Force 3 is filled in but it still says 1024 kilobytes which is one megabyte but my computer, uh, my video card's got 64 megabytes of RAM. So I'm going to select change here again and pick out the, the amount of RAM for my video card. So this took me to the video RAM screen. It starts at 1024. I'll just hit the down arrow until I get down to uh, 60, uh, 64 megabytes. And here, 65, 536 kilobytes is equal to 64 megabytes. So I'm going to select that and hit OK and move on. And now it's telling me the installation is ready to begin. It also tells me that a complete log of the installation will be in slash temp slash install.log after rebooting the system. 
All right. So I think it's a good idea to keep that file because later you're going to want to determine, oh, did I really install that software? I don't really remember. And then you can just look at your install.log to see if you installed something already. You don't want to install it twice. And, and, and if you already installed it, you, you, know, you want to just know where, where it is and that kind of thing. So this is going to give you, a, this is going to be a good reference source and, and keep track of some information from the install process for you. So I'm just going to select OK and start out the installation here. And the first step in the installation is formatting the file system. Okay, so, so this is the first step in the installation. Now the installation has officially begun. Well, now we get the rewards for all the, the answering all those questions and stuff. We get to kind of kick back now and watch the operating system install in front of our eyes. The first thing that happens here, it says transferring the install image to the hard drive. And then it starts installing all those packages that we asked it to install. It installs all the packages we asked it to install and also all the things those packages depend on. You can see here it's uh, installing the GNU libc libraries. Now it's installing shadow utils, which are utilities for managing accounts and shadow password files. Now it's installing SendMail, which is a mail transport agent. And eventually, if you install enough software that couldn't fit all on the first disk of the distribution, it'll come along and say, insert disk 2 to continue. OK, so I'm just going to hit spacebar here to select that. And now it's on to installing libraries for the Emacs editor. And now it's done installing the packages. I didn't show you a screenshot of every single package being installed. They're basically all the same. And some of them take under a second, so I couldn't even grab them on the screenshot. I'm not that quick. But uh, per now it's performing a post-install configuration. And now you have the choice of creating a custom boot disk for your system. So basically what this is, is if, if your hard disk ever gets corrupted and Linux is not able to boot, either because some critical file is corrupted or the, the first uh, piece of the hard disk is corrupted where the master boot record sits, if something like that gets corrupted, you're going to want a, a, an emergency boot disk so you can boot your operating system and, and ideally you'll be able to fix those problems that are on your uh, hard disk and, and you'll retain all the information that you used to have. Okay, so I think yes is, is the right choice to make here. Stick a floppy into your floppy drive and create one of these custom boot disks. And now we've got to configure our monitor. And just like for our video card, it wasn't really able to recognize our monitor. It just says uh, generic standard VGA monitor. I'm going to select change here and go into a list and actually pick my monitor manually out of the list. So I um, page down here with the uh, down arrow key and I got it down here to my monitor which is the Philips 107S. So I select OK here and I get kicked back to that previous screen. And now here on the previous screen you can see it's filled in Philips 107S under monitor now. And it's also filled in the horizontal and vertical refresh rates. So I'm going to select OK and move forward. And now it's asking me to customize my X Windows configuration. It's asking for the color depth, uh, the uh, resolution, the default desktop is GNOME, uh, the default login, whether it should be graphical or text. So I like all this, so I'm just going to select OK. And now this is the screen you want to see. Congratulations, your Red Hat Linux system is complete. If you see this and this was the first time you're ever installing Linux, good job. Pat yourself on the back there. You did a great job. And now what you want to do is you want to remove any of the media out of your uh, system that you use to install the system, like the CDs or the floppies that you use uh, to, to create your initial installation. You want to take those out so now when your system boots up, it's going to boot up off the hard disk. So I'm going to select Enter here. And now I have, the, it, say, it says up here, Grub version 0 0.90, and now I can boot Red Hat Linux. And you can see here, it says the highlighted entry will boot automatically in six seconds, or you can just hit enter to boot the one that's selected right now. And now the system's booting up, and we're getting messages from the system boot process. More things are booting up. You can see uh, various things as they come up, mounting the proc file system, uh, you know, uh, outing the, activating the swap partition. Everything that says OK here has come up successfully. And you can just see more and more stuff is saying OK as we work down. And finally, you get the login screen. So your login screen might not look exactly like this if you don't have Red Hat. But the point here is you type in your username, uh, then you type in your password, and you should be logged onto your system as the normal user. Good job. Well, this wraps up our installation of Linux video. Basically, I just walked you through the installation process of Red Hat Linux, installing it off of a CD using the text mode interface. But if you're installing some other version of Linux or you're installing it with the GUI interface instead of the text interface, it's going to be basically the same. Maybe some other distribution is going to ask you the questions in a different order or something. But if you watch this video through once and then you go to do your installation, you should be perfectly prepared. And the text mode interface is what I was showing you here, but you know the graphical interface 
case is going to be pretty simple and it's going to, you know, like I said, all the questions are going to be the same. Just the interface is going to be different, but it's going to be simple enough that you'll be able to pick it up right away. Well, good job installing Linux if you've already done it. If not, good luck installing it. And uh, I hope you found this nugget informative and thanks for viewing.